As we go through the book of Proverbs, there's uh, a few verses that some of us have heard or read before, maybe even memorized, and some stand out with great poetry. And a few weeks back, there was one in, as I preached part of chapter 11, somebody came up to me afterwards and says, you missed a verse. And I thought, did I not read one that was up there? And so they pointed out what it was, and it's uh, found in chapter 11, verse 22. I said, oh, what I said was, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to skip one, but when I heard which one it was, I said, I did mean to skip that. We're not skipping it today, okay? So, uh, the way of truth is life. Maybe you know where we're going to go when you, when you see that. But I want to read this verse to get started here. It's Proverbs eleven twenty two, and it reads like this. As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Okay. Now that can be a toxic verse if you, if you take that the wrong way, okay? But of course, the, no matter how much you dress up a pig, it's still a pig, right? Uh, so when you put jewelry on a pig, it wastes the jewelry and it irritates the pig. You can't hide some things no matter how you try. And so it doesn't matter how beautiful and nice somebody might be, if they don't have certain qualities, you can't dress it up enough. We're going to be looking at truth today and truthfulness as opposed to untruth. And I want you to think about when a little kid comes forward and says, uh, all covered in chocolate sauce, and they're filthy, and it's up in their hair and their ears. And you say, did you get into the chocolate? Uh-uh. <laughs> What's all that chocolate all over your face? And what do we do? We, we just grow with that as a little kid. My brother did it. Your brother's two months old, you know. <laughs> we all understand truth and lying, and we want to look at that today. So... Turn over to chapter 12, if you're in chapter 11 already, and I want to read verses 15 to 22. We're also picking up at a verse we ended with before, verse uh, 15, 12, 15, and it's going to start with the way of a fool. Remember we talked about how a way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man seeks counsel. So read along with me, verses 15 to 22, and let's look at how truth and untruth are contrasted here. Verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. He who speaks truth tells what is right, but a false witness, deceit. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword. Boy, does the poetry of Proverbs come out right there? Someone speaks rashly and they, they blow off steam and they have to thrust like a sword. That just, I thought that's so perfect. So again, there is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Verse 19, truthful lips will be established forever, but a lying tongue is only for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. 21, no harm befalls the righteous. But the wicked are filled with trouble. In 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Boy, not many things in Scripture get that category, but there it is. But those who deal faithfully are His delight. Lord, as we learn about truth, and really what your definition of truth is, and how important it is, let the words of truth penetrate our hearts and overcome a misbelief we have. In your name we pray, amen. Truth versus falsehood. Now, this is something that we all sort of deal with. If I'm going to lay out the Ten Commandments, and I've got one through ten, although we know this is wrong, this is probably gets rated number ten, right? As far as impact. We kind of want to give a pass to this because we say, well, yeah, I realize it's in the top ten, but we all end up doing it, and, it, you know, how bad is it? So we started off with the way of a fool seems right in his own eyes. And really, that's how we deal with the truth. We take the little bit of evidence we have, 
And we go with that. And that's all we do to investigate it. Seems right to me. I think that works out. So here's how you check this. They say that the top two joints on your index finger are the length of your nose. Now, I didn't tell you that because you needed to know that. I did that because I wanted to see how many of you checked right away. <laughs> and I can see you all from here do that. Usually we don't have to go too far to check out information, right? And we live in an information age. If anything sounds fishy, you can get on the internet and find out. If anybody teaches from scriptures and it sounds a little hokey, we all have Bibles and Bible study tools. We can find out. But we just don't. We stop at one level. And then when our word is contradicted, we kind of get a little hurt about that. So I form my opinions based upon how I feel about something and my emotions at the time. And I only select that convenient evidence that supports my narrative, right? That's what I have. I have what I want to believe, and I don't want you to contradictory. I might even say, that's misinformation. Quiet. No. If I teach you something and I say, but don't check it in your Bibles. You have to trust me. Don't trust me. Check your Bibles. The answer to misinformation is not less information. It's more information. Let's test this. Let's check it out. The way of a fool seems right in his own eyes, but a man of wisdom seeks counsel. Let's go after the truth here. But we all like to skirt the truth. I see here that it's, it's compared to uh, thrashing about with a sword, but one brings healing. So several ways we can skirt the truth. The first is just an outright lie, right? Absolutely tell a lie. This comes in phases. We have the lie, and then we have the big lie. And the final phase, the big fat lie, or the BFL. Okay. On the other end of the scale, we kind of have a, a word. We say white lie, or, or the better word, I fibbed, right? And, and we kind of, it's even kind of cute. I, I, I kind of fibbed. You kind of fibbed? I kind of fibbed a little. That would be a lie. So we don't like to do that. If somebody says, hey, we're, we're going to have a moving day. We're asking people to come help move all our furniture, and you don't want to do it. What do you say? I, I kind of fibbed. I said I had something to do that day. It's still a lie. So there's the outright lie. That's one way we skirt the truth. But there's another way we skirt the truth, and that is uh, we embellish. Right? Now, um, this is always, you say, your fishermen tell fish stories. Uh, the fishermen in our midst, I, th I think you guys have always been honest with me. You know, uh, when you caught the thousand fish that day, and they were all that far from the boat, you know, so. We all tend to like to leave a story a little bit better than we found it, right? It's easy to embellish. It's not quite... If you're skilled at it, you, you can even tell it, and it's not technically a lie or, or a fib. You can just say, I, I don't know, it must have seemed like it was 50 yards off, you know, whatever it was. But it's a better story. Embellishments bring glory to us. Embellishments kind of take things in the direction that shouldn't be, and, and my, my, one of my pet peeves is what I call the biblical embellishment. Uh, not meaning to offend anybody here, but there are those books those movies, those TV shows that take the scriptures and add a little embellishment to them. And whether it's about end times or the life of Christ or, you know, uh, I think it's dangerous ground because we don't check out the truth. So is it less true? Well, we don't know if it's true. Whether it's a, a series, a Left Behind series, I'm not knocking them or The Chosen or... No, not the shack, for sure. But uh, if those are favorites of you, I would just caution you that, that uh, they embellish. And if you want to know what happens, go to the Scriptures, okay? Uh, they can be kind of minefields there. But there's also a third way we skirt the truth, and that is we just don't always tell 
the told truth. We select the narrative, in other words. If I want you to, to do something and I'm trying to convince you to, to vote a certain way or to read a certain book or spend your money a certain way, I'm going to only tell you the facts that direct you in that direction. And so we rightly call that a narrative and not the truth. And, and we're familiar with this. This is how news media operates today. This is how, quite frankly, some preachers preach today. We select a narrative. This isn't how it's done. But does it really matter? I mean, is it, can we just say it's this human nature, it's going to happen, and we just want to be wise about it? I submit to you it does matter, and we find out why in chapter 14. So skip over chapter 13 in Proverbs and look clear down to 14, verse 5. And the scriptures say this, A trustworthy witness will not lie, but a false witness utters lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom and finds none, but knowledge is easy to one who has understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, or you will not discern words of knowledge. The wisdom of the sensible is to understand his way. Way is an important word here. We're going we're to come back to that. But the foolishness of fools is deceit. Fools mock at sin, but among the upright there is good will. Now when I mock at sin, I'm sort of going to make light of it or consider its convenience to move forward. Verse 10, the heart knows its own bitterness, and a stranger does not share its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. Now it's getting serious. People are being destroyed. But the tent of the upright will flourish. And then the clincher in verse 12, kind of the other bookend of where we started this morning. There is a way which seems right to a man, but it ends in the way of death. The way seems right, but it actually is the way to death. It might seem right. You might be in the dark and grab a, a bottle of something to, to have in the night, maybe deal with a little antacid in the dark. But if you grab the wrong thing, it could potentially be fatal. You weren't trying to be... A, dishonest here, but you were inaccurate, and the truth matters at that point. So it's beyond merely speaking accurately. We talked about not telling falsehoods or being careful with our speech, and we certainly should do that. We should, in fact, be fanatically honest. People should know us for that. But beyond that, am I, what I believe, is it true? Have I gotten all the facts? Have I taken the time to really research my politics, what I believe about medicine, what I believe about the scriptures, what I believe about other people, my family? Or am I just choosing what's going to help me feel good and right and, and uh, my side of the issue? I know some of you are, are trying to help some people right now that won't see both sides of the issue. It's just their, <coughs> excuse me, having their position win is what's important. My truth, in other words, my, my beliefs, is going, are going to steer my ways, how I go through life. But a mistake can be deadly. And that's why it's important that we're truthful. Not simply because it's wise or unwise or somebody's going to think you're rash and swinging a sword around the room kind of thing. It's not just an ugly pig with gold in the nose. It's more than that. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 21. We talked about it here a couple weeks ago as well. Remember we read about David uh, on the run. He's declared an outlaw by King Saul, and he has nothing. And he runs to the temple, and he, the tabernacle anyway, and he uh, talks to the priest, and he gets outfitted, and he takes off with the sword of Goliath, and he finds himself in the Philistine kingdom, and God delivers him. Remember we looked at Psalm 34. And we saw God's uh, deep provision to rescue David. But I said we'd be coming back here because David is set up for this through a falsehood. So I want to start in verse 1 of chapter 21. And there's some names here. We're going to set up what happens. David's on the run. He's been betrayed by his wife, his brother-in-law, who he's best friends with. Uh, hasn't come to his aid. His father-in-law Saul wants to kill him. His family can't help him. He's helpless. He has nothing. Verse 1. 
Then David came to Nob. That's the name of a town, by the way. A little bit shorter than Kettle Falls, which if you try to fit on an envelope, sums your... I've always lived in these places. Like Coeur d'Alene. Can you imagine growing up trying to spell Coeur d'Alene? That's too hard to spell. Well, you should have grown up in Nob. <laughs> Anybody can spell that. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech. That's a guy's name. So we'll make up for it with Ahimelech, okay? Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, I'm about to tell you a lie. Okay, this is, a, this is going to be a BFL here, okay? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commissioned me with a matter and has said, Let no one know anything about the matter on which I'm sending you and with which I have commissioned you. And I've directed the young men to a certain place. In other words, he's by himself. He doesn't have anybody with him. But he makes up this BFL, this big fat lie, to cover his, his story. Verse 3, Now therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or, or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread, if only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said, Surely women have been kept from us, as previously when we set out, and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was just an ordinary journey. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? What he's talking about here is, uh, can we eat this consecrated bread? If you haven't been with any girls, oh, that's, uh, that's our rule of life. You know, their, their bodies are, they're, they're clean. It's a matter of cleanliness, ceremonial cleanliness, or uncleanliness. So all that's left is the used bread that gets set out in the tabernacle area, almost as decoration. It should have been reserved for priests to take home. So it's kind of a gray area, and Ahimelech says, well, I guess if you're really in a hurry, I can give you this special bread, but, man, there ought to be some kind of rule. Let's just say that you're ceremonially clean. Got it, David says. Um, so we come down to verse 6. So the priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. We come to verse 7. Now one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. Let me just answer that question right away. What's, who is Doeg and what's an Edomite? Doeg, uh, kind of like the word knob, it's easy to aim to spell, right? He's not a Hebrew. He's from across the river in Edom. And he's Saul's chief shepherd. This is not an insignificant job he has. Remember what wealth, how wealth is represented in those days by livestock, by how much grain you got, by how many changes of clothing you had, how much property you owned. So his chief shepherd would have been his treasurer. This guy is high up. And for some reason, he's detained before the Lord. Uh, he's not a Hebrew, but he's in some way trying to show that he respects Hebrew culture, whether it's the Sabbath or, or he's, he's dealing with some limitation on travel. He has to stay in the land of the priests. We're going to see that he does not respect Hebrew culture except for what's good for him. But Doeg is there, and that's going to be important. We're going to see that dishonesty is going to bring death in this point. And there's a real lack of true speech with David. He knows the truth, but he feels justified in telling an untruth. Isn't it easy to be untruthful? I admit, it's probably what most of us struggle with. Not quite being accurate. And then we justify it. Well, I didn't want to tell him I didn't want to move. And I, I mean... That had been so awkward. What, I just, I don't like you guys? You know, I can't stand your, your dog. He's, he smells, or he's that yappy little dog, you know, or maybe he's a great big scary dog. For whatever reason, but we don't want to say that, so what do we do? I, I got a thing that day, I can't go. I kind of fibbed. You see, David is at that point here. Sin seems really reasonable at this time. It seems like justifiable. In fact, what do we say? I really had no choice. I had no choice. I mean, what was I supposed to say? Telling the 
I'm a wanted man. He's not going to help me then. Well, in fact, he goes beyond that. He builds a whole scenario. I'm, I'm going to need extra food. I'm going to need... You got a weapon? Can, we know that happens. He, he says, can I have Goliath's sword? Oh, yeah, you bet. Take it. It seems reasonable and understandable to be untruthful because we don't see the danger in it. But there's always a doe egg there. What's a doe egg? Doe egg is the thing that covers up for us, that shows what's really there. It's the ring of gold and the pig snout meeting. And somehow, untruth is found out. And that's exactly what happens. Doeg is going to be able to tell King Saul exactly what he saw. Turn over to chapter 22, or 22, yes, next page. This is a rather long passage, so I'll kind of, as I go through it, we'll give some description here. But we're going to start in verse 6. And Saul is uh, standing here in the land of Benjamin. It says he's under a tamarisk tree. I couldn't find out what a tamarisk tree was. Sounds interesting. But he's outside. He's sitting on a rock. And he's got his spear in his hand, okay? Verse 6, Then Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. Now Saul was sitting in Gibeah, under the tamarisk tree, on the height, with a spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. Saul said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, O Benjamites! Will the son of Jesse also give all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me, so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me and lie in ambush as it is this day. Do you all feel bad for Saul? Nobody feels sorry for me. They don't say a word, by the way, because he's got his spear in his hand, and he's been known to huck this thing, even at his own son and his son-in-law. So don't make him mad. They don't know what to say. But he's not happy. Oh, he hasn't checked out any of the evidence. He's just assumed that he knows what's going on. Verse 9, Then Doeg the Edomite, see, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the son of Ahitab. He inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Now we see some embellishment going on. He gave him matzah bread, which is basically like giant crackers. You got five of those. He got Goliath's sword. But it doesn't sound like he's forming a conspiracy. He gave him military provisions. He did a tactical, strategic inquiry of the Lord for him, and he gave him a weapon, probably an assault weapon, Right? Who does he think he is with his Second Amendment sword there? Okay. Verse 11, The king sent someone to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's household, the priests who were in Nob. And all of them them came to to the king. Uh, Nob to where Saul is sitting at is not very far. It's from where we are now down to the Boise plant, just down the road. It's probably about that far, so it's pretty close. He sends a messenger, and they all come up. The king wants something. Oh, let's go see the king. Verse 12, Saul said, Listen now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Then Saul said to him, Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him, so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush, as it is this day? I want to show you that he says, Hey, son of Ahitub, you and son of Jesse have conspired against me. In those days, if you were going to call somebody David, son of Jesse, that would be like your first and your last name. So I would say Don Williams. Or I could say uh, Mr. Williams. Okay. Now, remember when you were a teacher, some of you educators did this. Your class would come in and they'd say, "Uh, take your seat, Mr. Williams. It's time to start. But what would your coach say? Hey, Williams, get in here. It's, it's saying he has authority and, he, and is that so familiar there's not much respect. So when he says, hey, son of a high tub, you and the son of Jesse trying to conspire against me? Say, hey, Williams, you and Gavalia trying to conspire against me? Take your seats. 
There's not a lot of respect here. He's hot. He's got a spear. Tension's in the air. Verse 14, then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David, even the king's son-in-law, who is captain over your guard and is honored in your house? There's one set of evidence. You know, a little bit of research, Saul, you can see he's pretty loyal. Verse 15, did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Second piece of evidence. I do this with David all the time. Why would you think I'm conspiring? You've made him consult me before. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. Don't bring me into it. Whatever happened in your family, Saul, it's not me. Now Saul has a chance to take the evidence and turn the truth or act upon his his own assumptions. But the king said, verse 16, you shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. They want nothing to do with it. They're not going to go that far. However, we have a man that is not an Israelite, participates in a little bit of Hebrew culture, but is just salivating to cause great grief to Israel. Verse 18, Then the king said to Doeg, You turn, you turn around and attack the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests. And he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. And he struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword. And this gets grim both men and women, children and infants, also oxen, donkeys, and sheep he struck with the edge of the sword. He's making a statement here. He's not even taking the animals for plunder. His job is handling animals. But he's showing, don't you dare cross Saul, and don't you dare cross me. But one son, verse 20, one son of Ahimelech, of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have brought about the death of every person in your father's household. It's just a fib. I had to do it. It brought about the death of every person in that city. Saul has a lack of belief, where David had a lack of speaking truth. He has a lack of believing truth, no matter what is out there. Here's the facts, but his fears of David are so great, I can't see the facts. And if I haven't done that, I know we know people that have, right? It's not pretty, and in fact, it leads to death. And so this entire city gets killed. Sin leads to death, as the book of James says. When sin has its way, it leads to death. We aren't trying to get people to do good merely because you're supposed to do good. We're not just grouchy and want you to be good and not have any fun. Sin is deadly. Sin brings death. We are born with a spiritual death sentence because of sin, sin of our ancestors even. But there's hope. This is going to lead us right to this communion table today. So find the book of John, chapter 14. If you remember the title of the sermon, The Way of Truth is Life. If you're familiar with John 14, you know what I'm going to say. Just one verse here. I'll wait a little bit of time because you don't have markers in your Bible like I do. I just whipped right there. And Rob is kind enough to find it in real time for you. Not me. I just make you catch up. I will say this. As we come across this verse, 
Jesus with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper. It's where the, the communion meal was actually instituted. And back in chapter 13, he says, uh, I am now leaving and going to the Father. And they said, well, where are you going? Can we come too? No, you can't come. I'm going to the cross, guys. You can't. Peter even says, oh, I would even die with you. And the Lord says, really? No. You're going to tell a lie to not die with me tonight. And it's going to be a BFL. So there, it says their hearts are troubled. What are they troubled about? Jesus is leaving. And he tries to encourage them. We come down to verse 6. In fact, uh, he says, you know where I'm going. You know, you know the way where I'm going. And in verse 5, uh, Thomas says, uh, Lord, I, I, how do we know where you, the way you're going? We don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? Come to verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. This is the kind of verse you learn in, in VBS or you learn in Awana. And it's, it's valuable to teach that Jesus is the way and the only way to know God and to experience salvation. He says, I'm the way of life. We saw the way of death, and that is the way that seems right to me. But the way of life is literally Jesus Christ. What he says is the way to the Father. Now, we use this passage here to point that someday we're going to be with the Father in heaven and, and Jesus is the way there and, and he's going to assure that we get there somehow. But that isn't probably how the apostles saw it at all. When they came across the term, in my Father's house, they weren't thinking of heaven. In fact, there really is no place but here, if, if here, that that term refers to heaven. They would have thought the temple. And Jesus himself used it that way. Remember, this is my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. So they think of the tabernacle, the temple, and all that's around it as the way to the Father. That's in view here. In my father's house, the Greek word there is oikos. And it literally means not just a, a building, but like household. When we talk about the house of Israel or the house of David, we mean uh, David and all his stuff and everyone that lives there. In my father's oikos are many different word here. You say in my father's dwelling place are many dwelling places. In English, it kind of crosses over. The, the Greek word is meno or monai in this, this verb tense. In my father's household... There's a lot of room for everybody. If it weren't so, I would have told you. So when it talks about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, this is not Jesus being three things separate and apart. They are three interrelated aspects of being one with the Father. I am the way. How was the way to the Father? You went to the tabernacle or the temple, when it was built and you, there was a courtyard in front of you and there was an altar there. And unless you brought a sacrificial lamb or a goat, you could not proceed any further. A priest had to meet you there and blood had to be shed on that altar. And then the way went on into the tabernacle where there was several furnishings. There was the bread of presence that we talked about, the consecrated bread. There was a menorah that shone light and there was incense coming up. And behind, in that room was a curtain. That was the holy place. Behind that curtain is the holy of holies, or the most holy place. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm, I'm literally the altar. That's And the truth, or light. Picture the menorah. On through to the place where life takes place, at the mercy seat. The sprinkling of the blood. Light is mentioned 24 times in the book of John. Life 47 times in the book of John. He wants to emphasize that Jesus is the way to the Father. He's the light that shines on the way to life. Chapter 1 even says that. Jesus is the light that men might know life. I'm the way, the altar, the burnt sacrifice. 
that shows the truth, the light, the menorah, the lampstand, to the mercy seat where the blood is sprinkled and sin is taken care of. I'm the way that sin is taken care of. Nobody comes to the Father and gets that done except by me. No other way or truth or life. See, these things only have meaning in Christ. Why does the truth matter? Because Jesus is the truth. Why does his way only matter? Because he is the way. There's not several ways to God. There's not several ways that are true. There's one truth, and all other things are false. So you could read it literally like this. Jesus is the exclusive and only way to God. There is no other way to God. Jesus is the truth, and he's the only truth, and there's no other truth. Anything else that claims to be true is not just another viewpoint. It's false. He is the only truth. Everything else is untruth. And his life is the only true life. We have all been to funerals where people didn't know Jesus, and we tried to paint that the best we could. We'd say, well, he did well what he did in life with all his heart. You know, let's say a guy was into to skydiving. Boy, he loved skydiving. He knew all about it. And, and uh, he made that final jump at the end. And we try to say, you know what? No matter how much he accomplished in life, no matter how good he was at skydiving, no matter how many times he, he got to do the jump, and how much thrilling it was, his life still ended in death and he has no more life. There is one life, and only one only, that lasts forever, and that is the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. No other way, no other truth, no other life. The truth matters because of Jesus. Oh, there are ways that seem right. But there's just the way of truth. And it was opened by Christ and given to us. He's our Redeemer, our Savior, our friend. All the redemption songs you sang about point to the fact that He did the heavy lifting and brought us to Him. And His death overcomes our death. So here's the gospel that fixes things. The gospel is that we all had a sin problem. And we can't lie our way out of that one. We uh, are destined for physical death and spiritual death. Jesus came in the flesh and he lived a sinless life. And then he went to the cross and he died and bore all our sins. And then he rose from the grave. That's the gospel. You need to repent and believe if you haven't done that. If you have, you need to walk in that light because that's what matters. And that, my friend, is the gospel.